Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is, on, is entitled, Resting in Christ. And this particular lesson, number five in that series, is entitled, Come to Me. Let's see, where would that be from? It's in quote, double quotes there. It's the lesson for, Ju from Ju for July 30 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we gather here as usual, thanking you for the blessings that you place upon us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to learn of you from these lessons. May we grant, may we get what you have granted to us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, back to that familiar passage in Matthew 11. What is Jesus asking us to do when he calls for us to come to him? I mean, he's not physically present anymore. And what does it mean to take my yoke upon you or take your yoke upon, upon us? What burdens are we to give to Christ and does, does he give us any burdens in exchange? Well, let's read the famous passage here plus a few extra verses. Jim, you want to start there for us? Matthew 11, verses 20 to 28. The people in the towns where Jesus had performed most of his miracles did not return from their sins. So he reproached those towns. How terrible it will be for you, Chorazon. How terrible for you, too, Bethsaida. If the miracles were which were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would have long ago have put the sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on themselves to show that they had turned from their sins. I assure you that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to the people of Tyre and Sidon than to you. And as for you, Capernaum, did you want to lift yourself up to heaven? You will be thrown down to hell. If the miracles which had been performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have still, excuse me, it would still be in existence today. You can be sure that the judgment day got that on the judgment day God will show mercy, more mercy to Sodom than to you. Wow. At that time Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank you because you have shown to the unlearned that you have hidden from the wise and the and learned. Yes, Father, this is how this was how you warned it excuse what? me, this is how you wanted it to happen. My Father has given me all things. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. American Bible Society, 1992. Well, Matthew 11, let's be honest, turns is, is a turning point in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew is somewhat organized topically as opposed to the other uh, Gospels. The statements, de these statements denouncing the important Galilean cities are the harshest heard so far in the Gospel. Jesus does not curry favors. He puts the finger where it hurts. He associates with the wrong people, Matthew 9, 9 to 30, 13. He, his claim to be able to forgive sins is scandalous in the eyes of the religious leaders, Matthew 9, 1 to 8. So in order to understand the context of Jesus' statements in Matthew 11, look at Matthew 9, 1 to 11, 13. Jesus, Jesus got into the boat and went back across the lake to his own town, where some people brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw how much faith they had, he said to the paralyzed man, Courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. Then some teachers of the law said to themselves, This man is speaking blasphemy. Jesus perceived what they were thinking. So he said, why are you thinking such evil things? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
So he said to the paralyzed man, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. The man got up and went home. When the people saw it, they were afraid and praised God for giving such authority to people. Let me interrupt for just a moment there, Terry. This used to puzzle me when I was a kid. My father was a doctor, and I said, he, he heals people all the time, but he doesn't forgive sins. What, what's going on here? We need to understand the thinking of the Pharisees in those days. Yeah. They believed that every disease was caused by some sin that you had committed, and that you couldn't heal the disease unless you managed to get rid of the sins. God is the only one who could get rid of sins, and therefore God is the only one who could ultimately heal. That was their thinking. So Jesus knows what their thinking is. He knows the difference, but he, 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 he uses this sequence to prove what? He's proving, in the eyes of those people, that he is God. He doesn't claim to be God, right on the, I mean, just openly, but he's saying, okay, you believe that no one can heal sins, no one can forgive sins, and no one can heal someone unless they're God? Watch me. Go ahead. Jesus left that place, and as he walked along, he saw a tax collector named Matthew sitting in his office. He said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having a meal in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and other outcasts came and pointed Jesus and his Don't. disciples at the table. Some Pharisees saw this, Pharisees rather, and asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such people? Hmm. Jesus <laughs> heard them and answered, people who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. Go and find out what is meant by the scripture that says, it is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. I have not come to call respectable people, but outcasts. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Now think of all the sermons you've heard preached about the sins of Tyre and Sidon, and especially of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then think about what happened in, in, in uh, Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin. Is it really true that if the miracles that Jesus had done in those cities had been done in Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah, they would be better off than the people in those cities? Blasphemy. If, if that's true, yeah. we better get, well, what kind of city could you live in? And do I dare ask, what would Jesus say about us today? Would he compare us to Sodom or Tyre or Jerusalem or Loma Linda? No, I didn't mention that. <laughs> Let us recognize right up front that we cannot carry our burdens alone. So we're talking about carrying burdens here. We need to recognize our true condition. It is hard for proud beings to admit this. But God commands us to come. However, however, it is hard for us to surrender. Jesus is giving us three commands in this lesson. We'll talk about them in some detail. The first command is, come unto me. The second command is, take my yoke. And the third command is, learn of me. Three commands with three words each. So let's talk about the yoke for a moment. That's one that we in modern times in countries like America are not very familiar with. It was a symbol of submission, but it also means that we are working in cooperation with God. The Jews were accustomed to farming, using oxen, pulling plows, etc. The yoke was a common metaphor in Judaism for the law. Are we prepared to accept his conditions of salvation? In Matthew 5 to 7, we need to notice, and I don't think this should be a surprise to any of you, Jesus' reinterpretation of the laws from the Old Testament are truly radical, even more so than the Pharisees' interpretation of them. They tried to make these things very difficult, but if you really tried to follow Jesus' terms, you would have to go way beyond what the Pharisees were doing. Paul recognized that to many of the Jews that keeping the law had become a burden. How do we know that? Acts 15.10 after much debate, Peter said, So then, why do you now want to put God to test by 
tithe by laying a load on the backs of the believers, which neither of your, our ancestors nor we ourselves were able to carry? Go ahead and read that. Matthew 11.30, Jesus said, For the yoke I give you, give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. Well, let's be honest. In our world, people scorn gentleness and meekness. People laugh at humility. On social media, one gets attention by being loud and noisy and weird and wild, even flamboyant. We are all familiar with that. These characteristics are directly opposed to God's ways. So guess who's in charge of all that? Contrast these words from Ellen White and from the Bible. A knowledge of the truth depends not so much on the strength of intellect as upon pureness of pur purpose. The simplicity of the, an earnest, dependent faith to those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance, angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the, richest, the rich treasures of the truth. Ellen White, Christ taught you lessons. Gordon, you want to follow up there? From Matthew 5, 5, Jesus said, Happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. Now, do we uh, in modern times think of the humble as very happy? When we say that Jesus was meek and gentle, let us not make the mistake of thinking he was a pushover. For example, read his standing up and accusing the Sanhedrin. We only have one recorded time when he was invited, he was not just invited, he was more or less compelled to stand in front of the Sanhedrin and explain why he had done what he did. And boy, he just, I mean, he ends up by saying, you are the sons of your father, the devil. Wow. You know, and, and this is God speaking. And Matthew 23, where he calls them Pharisees and teachers of the law, hypocrites. But Jesus had a very tender heart. And Luke 19, 41 to 44, which we don't have time to read right now, Jesus was even consider, considerate of those who were hungry. Remember, twice he fed people by the thousands, starting with the simple lunch. He didn't want them to go home hungry. While Moses was the preeminent figure in the Old Testament, he was also humble and meek. If you remember one time when Moses was directly challenged and challenged by his brother and his sister, God said to him, and he wrote it down, Numbers 12, verse 3, Moses was a humble man, more humble than anyone else on earth from my good news Bible. And would you? Humbleness wasn't a, considered a virtue then. Either. No, any more than it is now. <laughs> and, you know, if you were thinking, okay, we want someone who's going to take us to the land of Canaan and help us to conquer enemies. We need a proud, powerful general. The most humble man in all the world. <laughs> that just seemed, didn't seem right, did it? And it was Moses who wrote that. Yes. So who gave him permission to write that? So what is Jesus doing for us when we take his yoke? Are we only serving him? Instead, we need a savior who can stand in our stead, not just as an intercessor, but as our substitute. That'll lead to some questions. Intercession is important, but it is only God hanging on the cross as our sin bearer as the one who paid in himself the penalty for our sin, who can save us from the legal consequences, that's another question, that our sins would justly bring on us. This is why, however great, the example Jesus was for us, it would all be for nothing without the cross and the resurrection. So, where are you taking that from? That's from our Bible study guide, our adult teacher's Bible study guide. And let's look at that. Let's examine it more carefully. Is it our legal standing with God that needs to be corrected? Well, in what sense was Jesus a substitute? Well, let's be honest. In the broadest possible sense, 
Jesus died so that we do not have to. Now, technically, that's a substitute. Now, how that happened and why it happened, that's another whole story. His life and his death demonstrated the answers to all of the major questions and refuted all the accusations that Satan had made against God. Those issues are made clear to us in his life and death. The great controversy cannot come to an end and we cannot be saved until all of those issues have been resolved. God is not going to bring this earth to an end or the great controversy to an end until every single issue has been resolved because he's not going to take any chances of having another great controversy arise after we take after the third coming. So with whom is Jesus pleading in heaven? Now this is something that many of our Christian friends would dispute. The details of the investigation of our lives in heaven prior to the second coming and what do we call that period of time prior to the second coming? Pre-advent. The pre-advent judgment going on right now. We believe, as Seventh-day Adventists, that that judgment began in October 22 of 1844. If you read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, and Daniel 7, 9 to 10, you will notice several very important points. Our accuser in the judgment is whom? Satan. Satan not God the Father, as many assume. And if you want to find out where he's a called the accuser, read Revelation 12, 7 to 12. Two, the pre-advent judgment is for the benefit of the onlooking universe. God already knows who is safe to save and who is not. How do we know that? The names of the saved are already written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the creation of this world. Now, many people who don't believe in God's ability to foretell the future question that. But the, the Bible says so. Now, if you start questioning which parts of the Bible you're going to believe, you're on very shaky grounds. God conducts that pre-advent judgment for the benefit of the onlooking universe who certainly must have questions about the safety of admitting an enormous number of former sinners into the kingdom of heaven. Wouldn't you have some questions? <laughs> I look around me and I say, yeah, I've got questions. Jim? Were you, were you yeah. looking in a mirror when you thought that? Um, I don't have to look in a mirror. <laughs> I know already. Jim, you want to pick that up for us? Revelation 13? Verse 8. All people living on earth will worship it, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the lamb that was killed. So there's your evidence from Scripture that uh, the, the, the names of the saved are already long since written in the book. Now, I don't some, know what... Some call that predestination, or some interpret that as predestination. Yes, yes. And the reason those names are written there is because God can look in advance and see what our choices are. He doesn't write our names there and then determine to... Uh, you know, sort of stamp a seal on us that says, you're going to be saved, you're going to be lost. No. Number three, what else can we learn here? When Satan accuses us before the onlooking universe, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all on our side pleading for us. And there's verses, 1 John 2, 1, John 14, 16, and 26, John 15, 26, and 16, verse 7. I mean, if you do your homework, all the evidence is there. Number four, in the end, truth will prevail. Each individual will agree with God's judgment and accept his verdict because of the overwhelming evidence for that fact. Now, does that include people outside the city at the third coming when the, when the judgment is revealed? Or does that include only the people on the inside of the New Jerusalem? Not sure. Each individual, it says, each individual, how many does that include? Everyone. Everybody. Well, where's the evidence for that? Well, I turn to a very specific quotation from Ellen White. Carrie? As soon as the books of record are opened and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. Okay, so this is 
clearly at the time of the third coming, when the New Jerusalem comes down to this earth and the wicked are out scattered out there across the field and Satan is rallying them to go up and conquer the, old, the, 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 the New Jerusalem, that's in Revelation 19 and 20, the whole spelled out there. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is rise up on, a, on a, a throne high and above the city, and everyone can watch him, absolutely everyone, all the righteous, all the wicked, everybody is going to see this. Like it or not, you will be there, you will see it with your own eyes. And when that happens, it says, even the wicked will see what? Every sin they have ever committed. Okay, you want to go ahead, Kerry? Yes. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encourage by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant, hard all appear as if written in letters of fire. That's from Mrs. White's Great Controversy. Interesting there. 666. Yeah, it's interesting, that particular quotation. Yeah. For those of you who like to explore this a little bit more, go to The Great Controversy, written by Ellen White, Start on page 662 and go up to 674. It's spelled out in detail, the whole picture. The problem with sin is not that it causes us legal trouble. Sin is what? Deadly. Deadly. Charles? Romans 6.23, For sin pays its wage death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Jesus Christ, our Savior. Okay, which is more serious, being in legal trouble or being dead? <laughs> you can all smile, but I mean, let's, we, we have to read the text and we have to be honest with what it says there, right? Yeah. A great deal of evidence could be cited for these points that we've just spelled out here. If one wishes to review much of that evidence, to find particularly about the judgment, See Prophets and Kings, another book by Ellen White in her great, great series, The Conflict of the Ages series, starting with 582 to 592, and The Great Controversy, same book, I mean, same book we read, quoted from a moment ago, 479 to 491. You will get all the detail there that you ever would need, I think. Even in the final judgment, there is no harshness or, or vindictiveness on God's part. So, back to what we sort of started out with a little while ago. What did Jesus mean when he said, my yoke is easy? The word translated easy in Greek can mean good, pleasant, useful, even benevolent. I think of these words, many parents remember with delight the first steps their children took. Walking with Jesus may not always be easy. We may stumble, we may fall, but with his help, we get up and continue walking, getting better at it as we practice. We can be sure that whatever exactly Paul meant by the yoke of bondage, he was not referring to obedience to God's law, the Ten Commandments. On the contrary, it's, though, it's through obedience by faith, understanding that our salvation is secure, not based on the law, but on Christ's righteousness covering us, that we can have rest, true rest and freedom. Adult study, Sabbath school, Bible study guide for Wednesday, July 28th. So what does it mean for, to you to say that Christ's righteousness has covered you? Why do we need to be covered? Is Jesus trying to sneak us into heaven without the Father and the unlucky universe really knowing the truth about us? <coughs> Absolutely not. In Zechariah 3, we see that the filthy garments representing our old sinful ways are removed before the new robe of Christ, new robe of Christ righteousness is placed on us. Now, that's, a, that's an ongoing process. We don't become suddenly transformed in one minute. So it, it takes a while. God is not asking us to carry some load that we cannot bear. 
Think of the story of Moses trying to deal with all the disputes among the children of Israel. Exodus 18, 13 to 22. The next day Moses was settling disputes among the people, and he was kept busy from morning till night. When Jethro, that's his father-in-law, saw everything that Moses had to do, he, he asked, What is all this that you are doing on the people, for the people? Why are you doing this all alone, with people standing here from morning till night to consult you? Moses answered, I must do this because the people come to me to learn God's will. When two people have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide which one of them is right, and I tell them God's commands and laws. Then Jethro said, You are not doing it the right way. You will wear yourself out, and these people as well. This is too much for you to do alone. Now let me give you some good advice. And father-in-laws can certainly do that, can't yes, they? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never had a chance to meet my father-in-law. He died before I met my wife. But I, he was a, he used to be one of the very early professors or one of the starting professors in the School of Dentistry here in, at Loma Linda. I wish I could have met him. Again, the father-in-law said, now let me give you some good advice and God will be with you. Is it right? No, it is right for you to represent the people before God and bring these disputes to Him. You should teach them God's commands and explain to them how they should live and what they should do. But in addition, you should choose some capable men, or maybe women, but it doesn't say that, and appoint them as leaders of the people, leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They must be God fearing men who can be trusted and who cannot be bribed. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. You mentioned women. We know that not many years after that, a very famous woman was in charge of the entire country yep. by the name of Deborah. Yep. And Miriam was one and of Mary the co-leaders at, yes. at the time that it's right. talking right here. Mm -hmm. Let them serve as judges for the people on a permanent basis. They can bring all the difficult cases to you but they themselves can decide all the smaller disputes. That would be the Supreme Court, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I appeal to the Supreme, I appeal to Moses, Moses the Supreme, Supreme Court. Supreme Court right, right. That will make it easier for you as they share your burden. If you do this as God commands, actually it was the father-in-law commanding, you will not wear yourself out and all these people can go home with their disputes settled. Okay, but what do we say, what does the Bible say about Jethro? He's a Midianite priest of pagan. God. No, he wasn't a pagan. He was a Midianite priest of priest God. Of God right? yeah, so, he, so not all the people of God were descendants of Abraham and, and Israelites? Well, that depends on whether you're following the advice of some Pharisees and people in the Old Testament, or whether you're following the advice of Paul, who says anyone who is a Christian and follows God's will yes. is, a, a, is a descendant of Abraham. But in the bloodline, he was not. He was not in the bloodline. Well, no, technically that's not true either. He was a descendant of Midian who was a son of, son of Abraham. Abraham. Abraham's third wife. Yes. Keturah. Keturah. But not through the right line. Not now you're getting line. picky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the church is supposed to be a hospital for sinners. I think each it's of, a psychiatric hospital in many places. Yes, exactly. <laughs> But each of us, as we are being healed, needs to reach out to others around us and help them as far as possible in their healing. And why does God ask, to do, ask us to do that? This is not a trick question. God, we help Christ ourselves as we help we them. We help ourselves as we help others. That's right. Yeah. We are part of a large body. And what do we call that large body? The church. church. The church. What do we know about that? Church, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. Christ is like a single body, which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit. And we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, 
because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? And if it were only an ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. There would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts but one body. And so, how does that apply to our church? Are we all eyes? Are we all ears? Are we all feet? Are we all hands? Different gifts. Everybody has different gifts. Yeah. And therefore, I mean, the pastor may be the one who stands up on Sabbath morning, but God intends for every single Christian to be carrying the message to those around him. Yeah. Wow. We're the organs of the church. Yeah. The eye cannot say to the hand, well, I don't, I don't need you. Nor can the head say to the feet, well, I don't need you. Now, Gordon will tell us that the, only, the most important part of the body by far is the brain, and the rest of it is just to take care of and to carry the brain, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I mean, it's a well-established fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, on the contrary, we cannot do without the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And those parts that we think aren't worth very much are the ones which we treat with greater care. While the parts of the body which don't look very nice are treated with special modesty. I'm not sure if that's when we wear a mask over our face or when we wear other parts. Anyway, which the more beautiful parts do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honor to those parts that need it. And so there's no division in the body, but all its different parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. So, questions. How does bearing one another's burdens help us fulfill the law of Christ? Jim? Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. My brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, those of you who are spiritual should set him right. But you must do it in a gentle way. And keep an eye on yourselves, so that if you, excuse me, that you will not be tempted also, or two. He, excuse me, help to carry one another's burden, and in this way you will obey the law of Christ. Well, what, why do you suppose God asks us to carry one another's burdens? Is there some important benefit from doing that? We all grow. This is supposed to be a very important Christian verse. Yeah, I mean, if you help somebody else out and they appreciate it, what happens to that relationship between you and that person? It gets better, it gets stronger, right? And then next time around, if they help you, pretty soon you find out that the group is growing together, they're pulling together because they all appreciate each and every other one that's in, that's, that's in the church. That's, that's the way things work. It, um, this lesson goes all over the world, and many places of the world, they still use the yoke. Yeah. And it's not only one oxen, there are two of them. Sometimes more. Yes, yeah, sometimes more. And the two, sometimes they'll put them in. I've seen this. And so one oxen is a little stronger than, uh, stronger than the other one. So this is exactly what the Lord is saying. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, we are on one side and he's on the other side. But as we bear each other's burden, we are also harnessing ourselves together with the fellow believers. And the, the church really, truly really grows. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what do you think? Do you feel that walking the Christian walk is a heavy burden? When, when you find your work hard, when you complain of difficulties and trials, when you say that, and I guess Carrie, I should have let you read that. Yeah, sorry, I was thinking about what you were saying. When you find your work hard, when you complain of difficulties and trials, 
when you say that you have no strength to withstand temptation, that you cannot overcome impatience, and that the Christian life is uphill work. Be sure that you are not bearing the yoke of Christ, you are bearing the yoke of another master. <laughs> I had what master to, is that? I had to chuckle when I read that. Boy, that is really... If you think the Christian life is hard, it's because you're pulling on a drum, you're, you're carrying the burden from a different master. Wow. That's from Signs of the Times, again, from Ellen White, July 22, 1889. And a portion of that is in Child Guidance. So, uh, Charles? Upon Christ as our substitute. No, and there is need of constant. Oh, there's a need of constant watchfulness and of earnest, loving devotion, but these will come naturally when the soul of is kept by the power of God through faith. We can do nothing, absolutely nothing, to commend ourselves to divine favor. We must not trust at all to ourselves or to our good works, but when, but when as erring, sinful being, we come to Jesus Christ, we may find rest in his love. God will accept everyone that comes to him, trusting wholly in, his, in the merits of a crucified Savior. Love springs up in the heart. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, mm -hmm, but there is an abiding, peaceful trust. Every burden is light, for the yoke which Christ imposes is easy. Let me interrupt there for a second. What do you suppose Ellen White ta is me talking about when she says there's no ecstasy of feeling? Does that have something to do with religion? <laughs> uh, our faith must not ever be based on our feelings that we're yes. in the wrong track. Well, I, I used to work with a group of people who belonged to a certain church who thought that if there wasn't a lot of shouting and carrying on and sometimes even rolling in the aisles and, yeah. and speaking in strange tongues and so forth, you're not, really, you're not really a Christian unless you do some of that. That's probably what she was thinking about when she talked about ecstasy of feeling. I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. Every burden is light. For the yoke which Christ imposes is easy. Duty becomes a delight and sacrifice a pleasure. I don't think, you know, if we're really truly really involved, we don't even think that this is a duty or mm. it's a sacrifice. Mm. No. As parents, we don't sacrifice. Yeah. It's a joy. Do you, um, our children don't always think that what we ask them to do is a, do, is a pleasure, but uh, later on, usually if they've grown up with good discipline and so forth like this, man, this is great, you know? They enjoy. Um, my daughter comes home once in a while, my married daughter who's past the half century mark, comes home and she loves to work with mom in the kitchen. Hmm, I wonder how that happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did she love it all her life? Now you weren't supposed to ask that question. <laughs> I suspect she didn't all her life. <laughs> okay. The path that before seemed shrouded in darkness becomes bright with beams from the sun of righteousness. This is walking in the light as Christ is in the light. Ellen White, Faith That Works, Faith and Works, page 38, four, paragraph four. This is an interesting yeah. little book that not many people know about. The little book, Faith and Works, was a collection of sermons, complete sermons that Ellen White gave that someone thought, you know, we, we haven't, paid as much attention to these sermons as we should have. And so they put together a set of sermons that she, made, that she gave. Of course, remember, she, she preached hundreds, thousands of sermons. And they picked three or four or five, I'm probably, maybe there's 10 in that little book, particularly on the subject of faith and works, and put it together. So how did they have those recorded? I know they didn't have video cameras or tape recorders. Shorthand. Or, Shorthand, yeah. Shorthand recordings? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hmm. Yep. She had one, sometimes two people doing her right hand. As she would give her sermon, huh? Yep. That, of course, was later in her, her life, not when, 
not in the very early years. And then I'm told that really the shorthand, you almost have to transcribe immediately to remember all of it. I, I don't very know quickly. shorthand. But. Yeah. Shorthand was in business even in the 70s. I learned, yeah, I, I, I learned 70s, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, it was a language but, I couldn't learn. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm 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 intrigued that during Ellen White's time, there was Pittman and Greg, you know, two different sets of shortened kind of. And yeah. I like learned one of those, and it helped me later on when I was. In Some people think scary. my huh. notes or my writing is like shorthand. <laughs> yes, yeah. you must be a doctor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to comment? Uh, no, I was just going to comment more or less along what he was saying. If you've had anything to do with learning how to, I had to do accounting years ago. Oh yes. And there was you, there were certain machines you had to know how to use before computers came out. I thought computers were bad. One or two of those weren't so good either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I... There was various things that uh, kind of tied into what he was saying. I just was. I took a course in uh, statistics at Johns Hopkins University when I was working on my master's in public health. Statistics. And that was pre-computer, okay? Statistics has never been easy from what I Never has been easy. Oh. But they had these mechanical computer kind of things, and you would put your data on there a little bit, and you'd push a button, and it would go <laughs> And you think, how in the world could you ever come out with a right answer through all of that? But it seemed to, it was amazing. Now, it wasn't really before computers. I was using a computer in 1967 and 68. Uh, yeah, that's true. This was 74, so... so they weren't as common as they are today, and no. it's easy to well, use. Well, you, you, did, you, you didn't use computers to do your, to do your calculations in a, in a statistics class, I can assure you. <laughs> they took up whole rooms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember a, a whole, most of a room being taken up by a computer, and we were said, you're going to get to use a computer. See if you can teach it how to do a, a five-step program. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, anyway, what's the relationship between Christ's death on the cross and being meek and lowly? Upon Christ, as our substitute and surety, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted the, a transgressor. Let me interrupt there for a second. What does it mean he was counted a transgressor? He took on our transgressions. Okay, he was treated as a transgressor. Well, let's be clear. Was he a really a transgressor? No. No. So he was counted a transgressor. Okay, go ahead. This is by Ellen White, by the yes, way. Yes, yes. That he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. And, and I should interrupt again saying very specifically, this is talking about the experience of Jesus on the cross. This is her, her chapter on that. So go ahead. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. All of his life, Christ had been publishing to the fallen world, pub yeah, publishing to the fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chiefs of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, let's, let's notice this very carefully. He now is very burdened. He feels terrible because something is coming between him and his father. Okay, what's, what's the problem here? Now I've lost where he was. The withdrawal. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to stop there for a moment. I want you to think about this. What this is saying is that the results of sin, 
That is, separating Jesus from his Father, because sin separates, we'll see that in a moment, sin separates us from God. That anguish he experienced but by feeling that he, 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 can't, he can't really see his Father, he can't feel his presence, that anguish was so terrible that, I mean, he had been, his back had been ripped up. Yes. His hands had nails to him. His feet had nails to them. Those pains could hardly be felt. All he could think about was, I'm being torn apart from my father. Okay? Now, how is Satan responding to all of that? Satan, with his fierce temptation, wrung the heart of, Christ, of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as conqueror or tell him that his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation would be, was to be eternal. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. So Jesus is afraid that this sin, which is coming between him and the Father, is so offensive, so serious, that if he takes it upon himself, it's going to be, it's going to be all over. That's going to be the end of his existence. Okay? Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. And when will that happen? At the end of, uh, um, when the when the promotion closes for a person. Yeah, but the the time when it's really evident to everybody it's is right. at the third coming, okay. when that judgment takes place. And what are we saying here? Jesus felt exactly the way sinners will feel when they find themselves. Remember, we we read a few moments ago that every person will suddenly see and remember all the sins and the way they, they were led away from God by their passions and by their whatever in the past. And now all of a sudden they realize that there's a source of life. They're in front of us, the only source of life. And we are being torn away from that source of life. That's exactly what Jesus felt on the cross. Okay? It was the sense of it, sin. You want to read that it again? It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as a human substitute, as, as a man's substitute. Yeah. That made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Desire, from That's, Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 753. Okay. Now let's review that again. The physical pain that Jesus was experiencing must have been incredible. But in the mind of Jesus, what had lived, who had lived his entire life in very close communion with his father, the loss of the sense of intimate communion with his father was so terrible that his physical pain, quote, was hardly felt, end quote. And what is it that separates us from God? Isaiah 59, 2, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. Now, I'm very happy to say we don't have time to read that part on now, but if you read on in that same chapter, at the very end, just as he's dying, he realizes that he has successfully accomplished what needed to be said, and he saw the Father's presence, and he said, what are his famous words, just as he was dying? It is finished. It is finished. Yeah. So he didn't die lost, a lost sinner. He died a triumphant saint. But it was what separated him from God that led him up to that point was God's wrath. Okay, the term God's wrath refers to God simply turning away and loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So what is God's, how does God's wrath op op operate is what I'm trying to say. God, when we sin, we choose sin instead of God, he just gradually has to withdraw himself from us and let us experience what we've chosen for ourselves. He just lets you go. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have to... I'm thinking well, he this. doesn't just 
abandoned us all well, of a sudden. Take the story of the prodigal son. What yeah. did the father, the son took off? Yeah. And what did the father do over the time, period of time, whatever it was, he kept looking for it. He looked yeah. down every day. So it, it, God isn't, uh, hey, well, I can't stand looking at you anymore. No, he just lets you do your thing. You've, you've chosen a different master, so to yeah. speak. You've repeatedly chosen that. Yeah, oh yeah, it's not a one time, you know, yeah. one time and you're out. It's a, you're so set in your ways that yeah. you can't do anything different. Consider the awful pain and mental anguish that Jesus went through because of his apparent separation from his father while dying on the cross. Satan was doing everything he could do to convince Jesus that if he went through with this demonstration, he would be eternally separated from his father. Jesus was demonstrating the full and complete consequences of sin. And I quote again what we just read up above. Christ felt the anguish which a sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. That's Desire of Ages 753, paragraph 2. That is why we say that Jesus died the second death. It is a death that sinners will die, eternally separated from the only source of life, God himself. And very quickly, I know yeah. short for time, but uh, I think Christians make a mistake by saying by saying when Jesus died, he went to heaven. Uh, no, he oh. died the second death. Yes, that's right. Separated from God. Separated from, totally separated from God. What kind of mental anguish do we feel when we choose to sin? Temporarily separating, hopefully only temporarily separating ourselves from God. In this lesson, we have seen three commands from Jesus. One come to me, two, take my yoke, three, learn from me. Are we doing that every day? Let's just look real briefly at those three commands. The first command, come to me, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me is his invitation. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be open for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. Desire of Ages 329. The second command, take my, that is Jesus's, yoke, Matthew eleven twenty nine. These words may seem strange to us, but what do they mean to Jesus' original hearers? Jim? Jesus invites us to take his yoke upon our shoulders. The Jews used the phrase, the yoke for entering into submission to. They spoke of the yoke of the law, and the yoke of the commandments, the yoke of the kingdom, the yoke of God. But it may well be that Jesus took the words of his invitation from something much nearer home than that. He says, my yoke is easy. The word easy is in Greek, Christos. Is that were correct? Christos. Oh, Christos, which can mean well-fitting. In Palestine, oak yokes, excuse ox me, ox yokes, were made of wood. The ox was brought, and the measurements were taken. The yoke was then roughed out, and the ox was brought back to have the yoke tried on. The yoke was carefully adjusted so that it would fit well and not gall the neck of the patient beast. The yoke was tailor-made to fit the ox. Wow. There is a method, excuse me, there is a legend that Jesus made the best ox yokes in all Galilee, and that from all over the country men came to him to buy the best yokes that Gill could make. William Barclay, 1976, The Gospel of Matthew. Did Jesus ever make yokes for oxygen during for oxygen for oxen during his days as a carpenter in Nazareth? We don't know for sure. Would it have been correct to have had a sign over his door saying, the best yokes in all of Galilee made here? <laughs> he, would have, the, he would have to fit them, though. It's not like he can have yeah. a stock there. He's no, you got it. You got to fit them. The yoke which Christ asked us to bear is made to fit us. He is not asking us to bear a burden that is too much. God will allow us to be tempted. He will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able. Carrie? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. 
But God keeps his promise and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, then our third command, learn from me, that is from Jesus. Matthew 11 again. Charles? There was an unbroken oneness between Jesus and his Father. Never once in his earthly life did Jesus decide to act or think contrary to the Father's will. Even in the most difficult time of his life, Jesus surrendered his own will to the Father's will. In Gethsemane, when the fate of the world trembled in the balance and Satan wrung the heart of Jesus, with the fiercest temptations, Jesus prayed, Father, if it is possible that the cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. Perfect peace comes when one's heart and minds are one with Christ's mind. When, as, as the old song says, there is nothing between my soul and the Savior. We are at peace. Sin disrupts our peace. A broken relationship between us and Jesus upsets our peace. When we come to him desiring to do his will, yoked with him in service, he promises, you will find rest in your soul. Can I read this again? When we come to him desiring to do his will, yoked with him in service, he promises you're, you will find rest for your souls. Okay. And then to confirm that, John 17, 21, that Jesus said in his prayer. Go ahead. I think you've got time. Myra? I, I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. Is there anything that might separate us from living a life of faith and full surrender to Jesus? What would that be? Is there any reason why we should not give up our sins? Jesus calls us to come to him just as we are. Well, in this lesson, we have reviewed those three, three word passages calling us to come, to be yoked, to learn. And that's our challenge. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, these lessons teach us a lot of very important points. From things which are re relatively inconsequential to some of the most important points in the history of this world. May we gather them up and take them to our hearts and learn of them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.